Hi everyone, well, welcome to the week on observational studies. So we left off last week with thinking about causation and the nature of cause and effect evidence. Um, uh, one thing we um, learned was that uh, um, intervening in the world and trying to make something happen is um, uh, is one way to one important way to get at cause and effect. And in a couple weeks, we'll. We'll take up that issue of experimentation and intervention as a way to to um, probe cause and effect relationships. But a great deal of data and evidence and surveys and existing statistics um, are, are are sort of the, the the material of research that nevertheless tries to get at cause and effect uh, evidence. And a lot of that data is is observational, and and so it's important to look at how to figure out or try to get at a better sense of cause and effect with observational data just because there's so much of it uh, all, all around. And also we learned you know a bit last week that uh, you know there are ethical issues and challenges and barriers, practical and ethical barriers to, to actually intervening with, with uh, in, in many cases. So some things simply can't be uh, manipulated or, or changed uh, by researchers. So for, the, for that reason also it's important to know how to nevertheless try to get a cause and effect with with observational data. So let's look at so we'll take a look at what a what an observational study is, um, and then we're going to look at the main way at which uh, researchers try to to account for the weaknesses that we talked about last week, and that that is to to control for variables that might be common causes or distorting variables at work in the background. Um, so we'll look at what are control variables, and we'll think a little bit about how to choose control variables and and then look at some the way it looks and appears um, statistically okay so what is an observational study uh, so it doesn't mean you know bird watching with binoculars or, or whatever uh, it's not observational in that sense um, an observational study is a study in which the researchers they just measure or observe the world and do not try to influence it right so um, it's uh, sort of the notion of watching thing ha watching things happen in the world as opposed to or contrast with experimental or intervention studies in which researchers try to manipulate the world or they try to make things happen um, uh, now many studies as I mentioned and lots of sources of data are considered observational studies. So they're all the official statistics we talked about a few weeks ago, all the secondary data, government statistics, ongoing data collection programs, all of that all of that data from health surveys, education surveys, labor market surveys um, is, uh, is, is collected on an ongoing basis, but it's observational data in the sense that it's not the, you know, the government or whoever else is not trying to manipulate the situation they're just trying to record and observe the behavior of businesses or students or or households um, so all of that official statistics um, the huge app apparatus and the huge world of, of government statistics is is mostly observational data then we there are large sources of minute of administrative data or crime reports and vital statistics and Universities have all kinds of administrative data and school systems and businesses and all of that is again sort of observational because it's not part of a planned intervention, it's just observing administrative or other behavior. And then there are a wide range of nonprofit and other research institutes that produce large social surveys like the World Value Survey, the Eurobarometer, the General Social Survey, LAPOP is Latin American Public Opinion Project. All of that is also observational data. So all the, the whole world of, of surveys and polls and, and public opinion research, all of that is considered observational um, data, observational studies. And then if you do your own survey, we did a, an assignment um, just recently where, where you were asked to design a survey and, and, and if you were to carry that out, that would be an observational data set also. So there's simply a lot of, of, of studies and a lot of data that count as observational data. And yet we want to get at cause and effect. I mean, the main, some of our most important research questions are questions about what causes outcomes we care about or what are, what are the effectiveness of 
uh, policies or, or procedures. So we're often fundamentally interested in cause and effect, and yet the vast majority of data that we have to work with is, is observational. So the way researchers get at that is, or the way researchers approach causal questions with observational data is largely to use a control variables strategy. And, and this is to deal with this issue of endogeneity, which we talked a bit about uh, last week. Or, um, and that, that's the notion that um, uh, the independent and dependent variable may be caused by a common cause. They may be, you know, trace some of their um, variation to a common cause. Or there may be some even reciprocal kind of relationships going on. And so to get at that endogeneity issue, which is inherent in almost all observational studies, researchers use control variables. So what is a control variable? It's, it's a variable that represents common causes and that are included in the analysis in order to hold constant or equalize their influence. So the control variables are, in a sense, not of interest in themselves. They're in the analysis in order to remove their their influence. Let's look now at the study you read for this week, which is um, an interesting example of a observational study that, that uses this control variable strategy. And the study um, looks at the impact of charter schools on the performance of traditional public schools um, in, in the state of Texas. And so let me just show you a map. This is not in the paper, but I, um, I think it helps to visualize it. Texas is a big state, and it's broken up into, I think, over a thousand uh, separate independent school districts. So there's a lot of variation, a lot of different big districts and small districts, urban and rural districts, poor and wealthier districts, um, and so on. And they're scattered all across the state. And so th this researcher used data, which is systematically collected administrative data, on the performance of these uh, uh, school districts. So this is a, a district-level analysis. He's not looking at individual schools or students. He's looking at whole school districts. And then the question is, some of these districts have charter schools, and some of them don't. And um, the question of interest is whether the uh, charter schools uh, just having charter schools in your district, whether that spurs or encourages or um, motivates the public schools to do to do a better job. Um, so let's let's look at um, when you see a study like this. One of the um, important things to do is ask yourself what is the theory, what you know what what is the theory that this study um, aims to test? What is the causal theory or uh, what is the presumed cause-effect relationship? So, um, so I, I would always encourage you to sort of think with, think in terms of this basic X-Y diagram. X is cause, Y is effect, X is the independent variable, Y is the dependent variable. And then figure out what that is for the particular study, whether it's your study or a study that you're looking at. And then, and then, and then this helps kind of frame what, what we're going to ask in terms of possible common causes and control variables. So in this study, X is charter schools, you know, the presence of charter schools, and Y is the performance of public schools. And the theory is the presence of charter schools will increase the performance of public schools, so we, we would expect a positive relationship here. And the question is, well, we have to have data to test this theory. Um, that's what the researcher pulled together some administrative data to test the theory, observational data, and, um, and then we can examine whether there's a, a, um, a possible causal relationship. Now, um, the problem, however, is we can't just look at the simple relationship between X and Y. We can't just do a, a correlation or a scatter plot of these two variables. The reason for that is what we talked about last week. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, are there possible common causes. Could it be that districts that have charter schools, right, have them for a reason, and that reason may also be influencing the performance of the public school. So, and, and so there could be variables like C down here, common causes that both influence X and Y, and therefore cast doubt on what the real, or, or confuse, or um, the real world word is bias, 
uh, bias or confounding. They, they bias or they confound the relationship between x and y. So um, what could those variables be? Well, suppose poor districts, let's say low-income districts, were more likely to get charter schools, right? And also low-income districts have, a, let's say, lower performance on the test. So there, there could be a way in which the socioeconomic status of the district both, both influences whether it has charter schools and whether it um, um, performs well on the test. Or it could be other things. There could be schools, I'm sorry, um, uh, districts that are have particularly innovative, creative, progressive administrators would be open to having charter schools, let's say, and experimenting with education. Those same sort of, you know, open, more um, sort of, you know, creative uh, um, administrators may be also do other things that lead to better test scores. So there could be some leadership factor, I guess that I'm saying, in, in a way that would influence both you know, the propensity to have a charter school and, and school performance. Now, there are many of these possible variables. And, and the point is that we need to try to figure them out and, and, and account for them. So let's take a look at what the researchers actually did. So here, here's a table from the chart. Now, this is a regression analysis. And what they do here is they look at the this is, these are the independent variables. Actually, only this first one is the real independent variable in the sense of the causal variable. The dependent variable is just mentioned in a footnote here because it's sort of implied in the analysis. It's not shown in the list of variables, but the dependent variable is the pass rate on the, on the, on the, on the school test. And the key x variable, the causal variable, is charter schools. Now, they're taking the log, the natural log of charter schools, and that's sort of a technicality. We don't have to get into it has to do with the fact that the distribution is probably skewed and the natural log helps with the regression analysis. Now, all these other variables, class size, teacher experience, teacher turnover, percent of revenue from the state, uh, percent of staff bureaucracy, attendance, and then these soci uh, dem uh, demographic variables, African American students, Hispanic students, and enrollment uh, are all characteristics that the researchers want to control or hold constant or eliminate the influence of these things so that they can get a better estimate of the causal effect of charter schools on, on pass rates. And the causal effect is then represented by this slope. Uh, and over here we have the statistical significance of, of that slope. Now, because the logged units are a little... Um, tricky to interpret. I'll, I'll go to the next slide, which is a, just a dummy variable, meaning does the district have any kind of charter school or not? So it's coded 1 if the district has a charter school and 0 otherwise. Now, um, in this analysis, all these other variables are also in there. All the control variables are in there, just as they were before. The only thing that's changed is the measurement of the charter school variable is now a simple dichotomy or dummy variable. And here's the slope. Now the slope suggests that if a school, it's a positive slope, so that's consistent with the theory. So if a, if a school has a, char, if a, if a district has a charter school, students score about, you know, a half a percentage point, they pass their, their, their assessment tests at about a half a percentage point higher than they would have if there were no charter schools. Now, the standard error um, is a measure of the um, sampling variability or random variability in the statistic. You divide the slope by the standard error, you get a t-score. The t-score is greater than 2 or mi minus 2. You know, you get an absolute value. The t-score greater than 2 is considered statistically significant. So this is 3.6. It's, you know, much, much greater than 2. Um, so this this slope is statistically significant, meaning it's not, you know, not just due to chance. Um, but again, the the real point is sort of the magnitude of this um, coefficient. So a half a percentage point better in the passing rate is not a huge effect, um, but it does appear to be more than a chance effect, and it is positive, and it does indicate that maybe charter schools help public schools. Um, perform better, 